The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. We always like to give credit where credit is due, and since balanced budgets are one of our reasons for being at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we wanted to say congratulations on balancing the BC budget. Good evening and welcome to Voice of BC. I'm Vaughn Palmer. It is Budget Week in British Columbia and I'm delighted to have on the show the Finance Minister, Master of the Budget herself, Carol James. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Vaughn. It's great to be here. So I went through all the reactions to your budget and I've uh, seen a lot of them, more than I maybe care to admit on a live television show, but uh, I would say generally favorable response uh, from across the board, some reservations which we'll get to. And particularly the credit rating agencies were favorable. Uh, are you pretty happy with the response so far? I am pleased with the response. I think as, as you point out, there are always people who are, have high expectations who want more and that's understandable. There are people who are going to be unhappy with some pieces in the budget. And I've always said in politics that if you're making everyone happy, you're not doing anything. <laughs> so I expect that there would be some people concerned. But what I really wanted to emphasize was, was that the budget was balanced fiscally and balanced in approach. Um, I said back in September, you'll remember at the budget update, that I wanted to make sure that a budget didn't stand alone, uh, that it really is more than simply numbers. It should impact people in British Columbia. It's their tax dollars. They built the strong economy that we're seeing. So to make sure that we are balancing the budget fiscally, making sure we are prudent and, uh, and following tax dollars and watching them wisely, but also investing in the things that make a difference to the people in this province. That's the balance I tried to strike in this budget and, and I've been pleased with the response. Biggest area of complaint I've seen is around the new payroll tax, which will replace medical service plan premiums over the next few years. And I thought one complaint that I'd be interested in hearing your response is that you had a report from a task force headed by former finance minister Paul Ramsey on what should be done with this and it looks to me like you rejected their advice and went in a different direction on the replacement tax. We took a portion of their advice. Uh, so I did receive an interim report. We closed off the public consultation so I asked for an interim report uh, and received that and it made a couple of recommendations. Um, one was that when you get rid of the MSP we've eliminated 50 percent already and I'll talk a little bit more about those details. When you eliminate the MSP make sure you do it all at once. Uh, that you don't phase it out again in another 25 percent and 25 percent. That really when it's time to get rid of it you need to get rid of it. And then and their suggestion in the interim report was that you look at both a payroll tax and personal income tax. And we, people will remember that in September we actually increased taxes on the top 2% of income earners. So we did in fact increase our revenue on taxation, on personal taxation, for the top 2%. So the payroll piece was the piece left, uh, the employer's piece was the piece left. We feel that people in British Columbia have really uh, had a difficult time over the last 16 years. Affordability is one of our priorities. So we decided not to go further on the personal income tax uh, and to look at uh, recovery through an employer's health tax. So that tax is designed uh, where in 2018, there will be savings of 1.3 billion for businesses and individuals. We've reduced MSP by 50%. Everyone will be able to keep those savings over this next year. In 2020, we'll eliminate the MSP. So the employer's health tax will be put in place. If you have a business that has a payroll of $500,000 or less, you will not pay the payroll tax. If you're a business that has a payroll between 500,000 and 1.5 million, you'll pay a portion of the employer's tax. And if you have a payroll over 1.5 million, you're gonna pay the full rate, uh, which is the lowest uh, health tax in the country, the lowest tax rate in the country. Um, so that protects small businesses. Um, by our finance calculation, 85% uh, of businesses in British Columbia will not pay the payroll tax, will not pay the employer's health tax. Um, so we think it's a fair approach. We are bringing in the employer's health tax in 2019, um, and there have been some people who've been concerned about that, but we believe people are keeping the savings from 2018. Uh, they'll get all the savings in 2020, and so we believe there's a balance there to bring in the, the employer's health tax in 2019. We're doing some other things to support businesses, including we lowered the small business tax rate, uh, we're eliminating PST on electricity, 
scarcity for businesses to keep us competitive. So there are some other initiatives that are also making sure that we keep a strong business climate in British Columbia. Interesting line of questioning the first two days from the Green Party, Andrew Weaver and today from Adam Olson, and they generally, of course, have already agreed that they have an agreement to support the government, so they're not threatening to bring down the government over this. But Weaver has been asking, and, and Olson asked it again today, what exactly is your intentions on housing prices? And I've been gone over your statements. So you've said that the housing affordability plan is to make housing more affordable. Mm -hmm. You've said it's supposed to stabilize housing prices. You've suggested that you're kind of hoping that prices will actually drop. Um, Weaver said, okay, so what specifically are you trying to do? Is there a target? Are you looking for a 10% drop in housing prices, a 20% drop? What are you actually looking for? Well, I think we brought forward a very ambitious plan, as you know, 30-point plan uh, to address housing, both on the speculation side, uh, addressing supply and demand uh, in, this in this budget, and we'll talk a little bit more, I'm sure, about the specifics. Um, but it's going to take time, and, and I think some of that is the impatience, and I understand it, from the public and from the Greens, who really want to see affordability right away for families. That's not going to happen. It's taken 16 years to get to the unaffordable place that we're in now. The crisis was ignored. And so we're bringing in a comprehensive plan that, yes, we hope will make more affordable housing available for individuals in our province that will uh, stabilize the market um, and not see the kind of spikes that we've seen. Do we want more affordable housing and, and prices that families can afford to buy in? Yes, we do. But that's not going to happen overnight. And I think that's where the frustration that I hear is coming from. Completely understand it. But we're not going to see that kind of change, major change in a market. What we're going to do is assess our tax measures that we brought in, the speculation tax, the foreign buyers tax. We're going to watch those over the next year. We're going to watch where the market's going. There were some changes, as you know, at the federal level, yes. where the federal government made some, some tightening up of the mortgage rules. We may see interest rates increase yes. over the next year. Federal government budget coming out in this next year, in this next week. Uh, and so we may see some changes there. That has an impact on housing prices as well and people getting into the market. So we'll be watching all of that. We'll be analyzing that over the next year. If we need to make further changes, we will. Um, but you will not see, I don't believe in British Columbia ever, a burst of the bubble um, in real estate. I think really? we are, uh, I truly believe we're a province that people want to live in, they want to invest in, they want to be here. Um, but will we see a stabilizing of the market? Will we see a more affordable housing? We certainly hope that our measures, both supply and demand, uh, will increase that in British Columbia and we'll make sure that the prices are affordable for people because they certainly aren't now. I've heard though from people who say that the prices right now, especially in Vancouver, but also in Victoria, other communities, are not affordable right now. That the only thing that would make them affordable is a drop in prices and maybe a significant one. Uh, do you have in mind a target that would make things more affordable? Like how much would prices have to drop in your view to make more affordable housing? Well, we haven't set a target uh, precisely because these are new measures. Uh, the speculation tax, in fact, is going to be the first time a speculation tax mm -hmm. has been introduced in all of Canada. Um, our foreign buyers tax increase and spreading, spreading it to other jurisdictions is new as well. So we're going to watch, we're going to analyze. Uh, I certainly hope that there are opportunities for people to get into the market and that will, as I said, help with both supply and demand. Um, and I think it's going to be critical because we can't continue with this situation. I, I think it's important both on the housing file as well as the area of childcare to note that these are not simply um, programs to help with affordability and help families. They're also economic issues. Um, on the housing file, for example, I can't tell you the number of companies that I talk to who make it very clear that they're having trouble finding people to be able to move to British Columbia. We've got a hot uh, employment market. We continue to see growth and we want that to continue. But that means we need to make sure that people have affordable places to live. And right now when someone is recruited and they're taking a look at the housing prices somewhere else and they're offered a job there and they're offered a job in British Columbia, Often they turn us down. Uh, before we go to questions, and you'll hear questions, of course, as you say, from people who say they'd like to see you spending more on some things, which 
is common at budget time. I just wanted to take note of something that really jumped out at me in the budget lockup, which is every year in the budget, there will be contingency funds that are not spent and allowances, forecast allowances for if there's a downturn or revenue doesn't materialize. Mm -hmm. This budget is unusual for how much there is in, in that over three years, mm -hmm. plus there's an additional two and a half billion dollars of what are called priority initiatives to be identified later. So you've got about six billion dollars over three years that isn't allocated. I am sure you'll want to hold back some of that for, for uh, surprises and big forest fire seasons, but what's the philosophy there? Like what, what are you trying to do there or what messages are you trying to send to the people that are looking to the government for say mm -hmm. more program funding? I think a couple of important messages. One is prudence. Uh, in a budget. You mentioned some of the risks. ICBC continues to be yeah. a huge risk. We're bringing in product reform. The Attorney General is doing an incredible job of that. But there's a risk. There's a risk that the changes won't happen as quickly as we hope. Uh, that we'll continue to see a hole in, in ICBC's budget because of inaction by the previous government. So that's a big risk and we need to make sure that prudence is built in. Of course, NAFTA, free trade, what's going to happen in that area, softwood lumber, still outstanding. Again, I believe it's fiscally responsible to make sure that those pieces are in there. But I think the other important uh, direction that we're taking with this budget is that we're not simply looking at the short term. We're not looking at this year and what will make a difference or even in the next three years and what will make a difference. We're looking long term and that means putting money aside for things that we will determine need to occur over the next three years. Reconciliation with First Nations is a major part of our direction as government. We have not at this stage talked about revenue sharing for example or supports for that. That's an area that we've outlined that is still to come that we put some resources aside to make sure we provide support for that. New programs and services, when you implement a new program like childcare, we expect the demand could be larger than we predict. You could see many more licensed, uh, unlicensed childcare providers becoming licensed childcare providers. That's good news, we want that to happen. We want parents to get affordable childcare. That may have a pressure on the budget. We still have the poverty reduction plan and support for people who are living in poverty. And then there's bargaining. So if you add all of those together, bargaining, bargaining starts in 2019 yeah, for so all of the public sector. Yes, Everybody yeah. comes up at once, <laughs> nurses, yeah. doctors, teachers, public sector. And so if you add all those together, uh, in fact, it's probably going to be tight uh, for the kinds of resources that have been put aside to try and deal with all of those issues. But we felt it was responsible to make sure we had the dollars put aside and we identified the areas that we think that there'll be pressures in. Uh, we have a lot of questions on tape, and we'll start with the opposition finance critic, Shirley Bond. Here she is. Of course there needed to be investments in childcare, and we applaud the efforts that this government has made. But let's be clear, they went to British Columbians and promised $10 a day daycare. They did not deliver on that promise in this budget. They did not deliver on 116, 114,000 units of affordable housing. They didn't deliver on the renters that... Uh, a grant either. So from our perspective, those things matter to British Columbians. So, you know, yes, we're willing to uh, recognize the government has made important investments. Our question is, how on earth are they going to pay for them, not just today, but into the future? Well, uh, two pieces I want to raise. Uh, one, I'm, I'm pleased that the, uh, that the opposition critic now cares about childcare, wish they'd put a little more money in uh, when they were in government. We, in fact, are paying for the program, and it is a 10-year program. Um, we said that when we were running, uh, that it is a 10-year program to implement childcare, a universal childcare system across this province. Um, and we have made a huge step, $1 billion over the next three years that will go to help families. 86,000 families are going to see their childcare fees reduced by the year 2021. Families who are making 45,000 or less will see free childcare in many, many cases. So this is a major investment for both business, for our economy, and for families as well. We've balanced the budget. Uh, you will see that in all three years. We have contingencies built in, as we talked about, the prudence that's uh, important to British Columbians. And we're making sure that we're investing in things that are going to keep our economy growing. So I'm really proud, of, particularly, of the child care program and bringing that forward because it's a, a major transformational change in our province for, for our businesses, for our families, and most importantly, for children. 
You talked about this, uh, mentioned it, and it's, there's a lot in the, in the budget about the, the transition from license to unlicensed. Uh, what's the, tell people what the significance mm -hmm. is and, and what share of spaces right now are licensed and unlicensed. That's a really important piece, and unless people are involved in child care intimately, uh, they often don't know the details. Um, I think people sometimes presume that licensed care means big centers, and unlicensed care means not. <laughs> in fact, there are licensed family care homes as well. Licensed means that you follow the regulations, health comes and checks, make sure that you have the right equipment, that you have the right space for children, the right number of staff for the children you're looking after, and the right training, because children deserve quality care. I think we'll all remember the tragic Baby Max story, um, where a little boy was lost in an unlicensed care home. Um, no one wants that to occur. So what we're providing in this budget is support for unlicensed care to become licensed. We'll have incentives, we'll have support for training, for equipment, to be able to help them transfer to license so that we have the assurance that children are going to be well looked after. The families don't need to be concerned about where their children are staying. So that'll be the transition that'll occur. And we've already had calls coming in to the ministry from people who want to sign up, who want to be part of the program. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that because better quality care is good for children and good for families. Jordan Bateman with a question about the economy. Here's Jordan. Minister, there wasn't a lot in your budget around growing the economy. You know, you're not going to build the Massey Tunnel. There's uh, only kind of seed funding for the TransLink projects. And there's some money for agriculture and arts. But unfortunately, you didn't get past the letter A in the uh, overall government uh, spending program. What are you going to do to grow the economy? How do we make sure the economy continues to expand so that you're not always relying on taxpayers to foot the bill for everything? He didn't get to the letter C either, and he <laughs> was happy when you guys decided to finish building Site C. Exactly. Well, and I think capital, he didn't get to the C in capital either, <laughs> apparently, yeah. in the budget. Um, we, in fact, have one of the largest capital investments in the history uh, of British Columbia in this budget. 50,000 direct and indirect jobs will be building schools and hospitals and roads and bridges across this province. And we've still managed to make sure that our debt-to-GDP ratio is, in fact, lower than it was in September still well within the ratio that's needed for the rating agencies to make sure that we're fiscally responsible. But we will be building British Columbia, which will create jobs, as I said, in every corner of British Columbia. Specific transit projects that Jordan mentioned, many yeah. of those are in the works. Uh, we've committed to 40% funding for the mayor's plan when it comes forward. We're in those discussions right now, and the federal government's at the table as well. So stay tuned. There'll be some very good announcements coming out of that piece. Um, but I think there are a number of other things within the budget that that also focus on growing our economy long term sustainably. Um, we will know we have an innovation commissioner uh, who has now been appointed that will be taking a look at, at how to spur on the tech industry and, and other innovative industries in British Columbia. We are eliminating the PST on electricity for businesses. That's a huge savings that they've been asking for for a long period of time. That'll be gone in 2019 and provide an opportunity for businesses to expand. That's a huge piece. We lowered the small business tax rate by half a percent, second lowest tax rate for small businesses uh, in the country. Country. And then both our housing and our child care plan will help businesses with recruitment, with retention, uh, and with productivity. Because I have to tell you, when I talk to parents who are worried about the child care situation, they're not as productive at work if they're worried that their child is in an unsafe situation and they can't find a space. So those are economic investments for businesses as well. Take a brief break on Voice of BC with Finance Minister Carol James, and we will be right back with lots more questions. Stay with us. The Alliance of BC Students is thrilled to see that the BC government wants to invest $450 million into student housing. This takes students out of the unaffordable rental market and puts them into safe and affordable housing on campus. I'm Mike Farnworth, the Solicitor General for British Columbia, sometimes known as the province's uh, top cop. And I'm here to let you know that it's a crime not to watch Voice of BC. Where there are no bars, there's freedom. It's where we find the strongest connections. And power, we never knew we had. It's not always easy. And sometimes, you wonder what you got yourself into. But when the stars are your compass, 
you tend to find your way. There are more ways to connect with us at Voice of BC. Email us at vobc at shaw.ca. Follow us on Twitter at Voice of BC. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash vobc on Shaw TV. We're really excited about some of the announcements around cleaning up some of the affordability issues, tightening of loopholes around rentals. So many new teachers come into this province and they can't find a place to live or it's too expensive to rent one and that's because there's been all these speculation, uh, rent evictions, uh, housing flipping, it's making it really hard even if somebody gets a job to come here because there's nowhere to go. So this, this bodes well. And welcome back to Voice of BC with Finance Minister Carol James. And we will go straight to a question from the government's partner in power sharing, although it doesn't always sound like that every single day. Andrew Weaver, here he is. Overall, we find this budget quite refreshing. It's clearly a budget that's meant to put the people first and, and correct some of the uh, perceived wrongs that have happened over the last number of years. Um, what's lacking in the budget, of course, is a vision for the future, a vision for the future of British Columbia in terms of an economic vision. Uh, we continue to work with the BC NDP to, to try to instill uh, a, a sense of uh, excitement into the, a vision that uh, builds a sustainable economy, one that recognizes the importance of bringing our tech sector together with the resource sector to build on our strategic strength, not chase the weaknesses of others. Well? Uh, in fact, uh, there are a number of initiatives, and I talked earlier about the housing and child care pieces, which in fact are economic investments. And I think that's that's really the shift, and, and I support the, the comments that Mr. Weaver has made about moving to the new economy and making sure we're also supporting the new economy. We have a great focus on tech. Um, we're very excited about some of the resources that are coming to British Columbia in that particular area. Um, but I think the days of looking at something as either a social issue or an economic issue need to be gone. If we're really going to build the new economy, if we're going to build a sustainable economy, we have to link all of those pieces. We have to link support for our environment and climate action with the issue of building a strong economy and putting supports in place for families. That's why I think childcare and housing are so exciting because they cover those areas. We're also looking at increasing our carbon tax, but also working with businesses to bring them along. So the environment minister will be working on a fund. Uh, he's talking to business right now and First Nations to be able to provide support for businesses that are carbon intensive, uh, that really need support to be able to transition to the new economy. That's gonna be a very exciting initiative. And I think again, will spur on economic growth in British Columbia, provide an opportunity for us to be a leader when it comes to climate action once again uh, in our province and, and support businesses on our economy as well. Bill Tillman with a question about something that the Greens wanted done that you didn't do. Here's Bill. Minister, Green Party leader Andrew Weaver has suggested BC should ban foreigners from buying any property, residential property, in British Columbia. Why is Mr. Weaver wrong since you didn't do it in the budget? Well, we are in fact bringing in two taxes uh, in this particular area. One is increasing the foreign buyers tax uh, for people from outside uh, Canada who come to British Columbia and who don't pay their fair share of taxes. We're going to make sure if they live here, they have to contribute uh, to the great quality of life that we all enjoy. So we're expanding and increasing the foreign buyers tax. And then the other thing we're doing, as you know, is bringing in the speculators tax uh, because whether you're a domestic or foreign speculator, the people in British Columbia expect that everyone will pay their fair share of taxes. Um, someone who is just parking their money here and using housing uh, to be able to make money instead of to be able to live and work and be part of a community uh, is just not on. So we're going to bring in the foreign speculators tax uh, and domestic speculators tax that is going to make a difference uh, when it comes to housing that is going to bring in dollars that are going to assist us in building affordable housing, but hopefully close some loopholes, get rid of speculation in the market uh, and bring that housing back online for neighborhoods so that people can live in the communities that they work in. The definition of speculators as I've seen so far is that uh, you pay taxes in British Columbia mm -hmm. and it looks as if that the way that law has been interpreted in the first two days is that a person from Alberta who owns a recreational property in British Columbia doesn't live here comes here on holiday they would have to pay the speculation tax is that correct that's right unless they rent their house out 
unless it's in the market um, and the house is part of the rental market, uh, long term, not short term sure. rental, but long term rental. Um, so it's actively becoming a part of our communities and providing the kind of supply that we need. Um, but otherwise, if they're not paying taxes in our province, if it's a homeowner who lives in Toronto, for example, and has two extra houses that they leave vacant in British Columbia in case they want to come out for a vacation, they'll be paying the tax. Will a British Columbian who has a second recreational property be captured by this or will they have a way there'll be, there'll be a refund coming. They will not be captured. They will not have to pay the tax. There'll be a refund coming on their income tax form. Um, they won't have to pay it because they pay taxes in our province. And, and am I right in thinking that, that y your analysis is if you do all this, you don't need to go as far as they have in New Zealand and ban foreign ownership outright? That's certainly our hope. Uh, our hope is that these measures will, in fact, take a look at the market and provide more affordable housing. But that's why we're going to be watching it closely because, as I mentioned earlier, these really are um, groundbreaking measures and haven't been tried elsewhere. And so we're going to be watching them. If we need to make adjustments, we will. You mentioned the troubles at ICBC. It has a, a, a separate line in the budget. It is regarded as such a significant risk to uh, the financial picture for the next few years, and no wonder the projected loss is, I think, over four years or four billion dollars, something like that. A uh, question about getting ICBC back to the balance point uh, from uh, Move Up, Annette Toft. Here she is. My question is for the minister around ICBC. First off, I want to commend uh, the, the government for being able to balance a budget and present this budget with a $1.3 billion deficit at ICBC. I actually represent the workers at ICBC and so they've been uh, pretty uh, concerned in watching the amount of money going out the door at ICBC. My question to the minister is could you explain what exactly the government is going to do to uh, correct the problems at ICBC and turn this around to uh, return ICBC to a profitable and uh, value-added uh, Crown Corporation for British Columbians? So as I read the statement, the hope for a turnaround is in 2020. Correct. But you're saying even with the best of intentions, uh, there may be, it may not take, may not happen that quickly. That's right, it's a risk. Uh, and I admit frustration as a, a finance minister. There are things that happen that you just can't predict wildfires being one of those examples where you know you're going to have to build something into your budget that you can't predict. This one is frustrating because it was predictable. The government had reports that told them they needed to do something and they didn't and we ended up with a 1.3 billion dollar hole in the budget this fiscal year, never mind impacts the next fiscal years as well. Um, so the Attorney General has talked about the product reform we're bringing in, looking at a cap um, on, on minor injuries. Uh, that's work that we're doing over this next year so you won't see that impact until 2019. Um, we're also looking at, and I think he's already spoken about speeding through red lights um, and the red light cameras. Uh, and we're also looking at product reform when it comes to safe drivers versus dangerous drivers and what kinds of changes can be made in that area as well. So we're taking action immediately. But if we'd taken that, if the previous government had taken that action years ago, uh, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in, and we could have used those resources to be able to further support families. Uh, look on the Vancouver Sun website, folks, so you'll see that my colleague Rob Shaw wrote a story and posted on the site a report that went to Cabinet in December 2014 that laid out the emerging crisis at ICBC and some solutions. The solutions were not taken. Uh, the report has only come out recently, but uh, it does document that the previous government knew about this problem a little over three years ago in some detail. Uh, let's go to a question. You mentioned the carbon tax. Uh, let's go to a question about the changes in the carbon tax from the Taxpayers Federation. Chris Sims, here she is. So now that the BC carbon tax has dropped even the label of being revenue neutral, the BC government no longer needs to officially tell us exactly how much money they're raking in through the BC carbon tax, and they no longer need to tell us where they're technically spending that money in the budget documents. So I wanted to know, when exactly will we see a full accounting of the BC carbon tax, and when can we find out where exactly that money is going? So the carbon tax is going up about five dollars uh, per ton of emissions April 1st this year and every year thereafter another five and it will bring in on that schedule we're told by finance officials about 1.2 billion in additional revenue over the three years. Uh, I was surprised when I looked at the budget report 
that there was no indication, uh, first of all, how much money is coming in, new, and what's going to be done with it. There's a general discussion, but there's no dollar for dollar breakdown of where the money's going. Uh, work being done, and I appreciate the question because I think it's important to note first that uh, the previous government talked about revenue neutrality and put a whole number of things into that list that had absolutely nothing to do with climate action uh, or addressing the carbon tax revenue. So we'll be proud to put together where the resources are being spent because we want to ensure that the dollars are being used for green initiatives and to support families with the additional cost and businesses who are energy intensive, uh, industries that are trade exposed, uh, they need support as well. So the tax is just starting in to be increased April 1st. So that's work we'll be doing with the Minister of the Environment. He's working with the Climate Action team right now. He's out consulting with businesses about how to make sure that resources are put aside for businesses to help them through this transition and to help them transition themselves. Because if we don't bring business along, we're not going to address our, our climate action strategy. We will be increasing the low income credit that people get on climate action. That'll first check will come out in July. That'll be increased because of the increase in the carbon tax and we're going to increase that each year. So we'll be accounting for those dollars as well. So uh, it's not required that we include the uh, revenue neutrality because we don't want to make it revenue neutral. We want to use those resources for green initiatives and make sure the money is actually addressing climate action. And we'll be proud to put that report out because we'll want to talk about the initiatives that are happening and the support British Columbians have as well. So things like incentives to retrofit public buildings mm -hmm. or for an industry that's currently burning diesel fuel to start using cleaner electricity. That's the kind of thing that could be covered. Exactly. Transit prog programs, for example, new transit, uh, which is a huge climate action uh, piece when you take a look at getting right. people out of their cars. Those will also be part of the initiative. So we'll be able to talk about all the different direction, pieces of direction we're taking. The Minister of the Environment, as you know, put together a new climate team. So that just happened a couple of months ago. It wants time to take a look at that report that was ignored by the previous government. Make sure we're implementing that and set priorities on that as well. So he's having some great discussions with business. I've had some conversations as well. They're looking forward to coming to the table and coming up with a, a great fund, a great solution, and we'll be happy to talk about that. Uh, you mentioned this a little earlier as a work in progress, a specific question on it, pover poverty reduction strategy. Here's Trish Garner. So I'm here on behalf of the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition and we are pleased to see significant investments in housing and childcare to tackle the breadth of poverty, but we see little in the BC budget to tackle the depth of poverty. So folks on welfare, basic welfare in BC are still stuck at $710 per month, um, which is about 40% of the poverty line. So that's a big hole to climb out of. So my question for you, Honourable Minister Carol James, is when will we see an increase to close the gap for our poorest British Columbians? So your government has promised a poverty reduction legislation, actually, which will have targets in it and, and, and report out. Presumably we'll be getting that at some point. It's not funded yet in the budget. That's right. We've been doing uh, consultations, public consultations, including people who are living in poverty, to make sure that the strategy we put together is comprehensive. We will legislate targets. Uh, we will be bringing forward a plan. That's part of why those dollars, as I mentioned earlier, are put aside, because we know there'll be actions that will come out of putting a poverty reduction plan in place. Um, we took small steps, and, and I certainly take the point. It's one of those areas that, um, you know, resources resources need to go towards. Um, we took small steps in September. We did increase income assistance and disability rates by $100 a month, one of the largest investments that happened in years. We got rid of the clawback for people with disabilities on the bus pass, and we increased earnings exemptions for both people with disabilities as well as those on income assistance by another $200. So they, if they're able to work, they're able to make a little more. But there's a long way to go. Housing will start assisting in some of that area. We are putting in place housing for for people who are homeless and people with mental health issues, often individuals who may be on income assistance and not able to work. So there's some supports going in there as well, but um, I certainly agree with the point. There's much more to be done. Our poverty reduction plan will put that strategy in place and we'll begin funding it. Pharmacare change in the budget too, right? The Pharmacare change makes a huge difference again. We are increasing uh, support for low-income families and seniors. Right now there are people who can't afford to fill the prescriptions. They're making a decision about that or food. We're getting rid of those 
deductibles um, for people that they have to pay before they get free medications. So they'll get free medications from the start and won't have to make those difficult choices. And that's a hundred million dollar item. I think. It is. It's yeah. a very large program and will make a huge difference to British Columbians. Uh, let's go to the nurses union, Christine Sorensen. Uh, this is the kind of thing you used to hear the nurses' union say about the previous Liberal government, so uh, she hasn't given up on the theme. Here she is, Christine Sorensen. Hallway patients, uh, people who are waiting five, six hours to see a physician in an emergency room, nurses who are providing care in shower rooms and in hallways. This has become the new norm of health care. So, Honourable Minister, how are you and your government going to ensure that the supports are in place so that nurses can provide safe patient care in BC. There's additional money going into the Ministry of Health, uh, a large investment in the Ministry of Health, but on this particular issue there's actually money going in specifically to make sure people are able to get team-based care. There's so many people who don't have doctors and a lot of the pressure that hospitals are facing is people have no other choice and so they end up in the emergency room when they could be seen, and nurses are critical to this, could be seen by a nurse or a nurse practitioner, get good quality health care through a team-based approach and not have to go to the emergency room which frees up the emergency room for those people who are waiting in hallways. So that's a target for our government is to look at those patient care centers to provide the support and there's money in the Ministry of Health to get going on that work. And we take a brief break on Voice of BC again. Uh, we will be right back. Final segment with Finance Minister Carol James and a lot more questions to come. It was actually our recommendation to move on affordability in this way. We knew that after 16 years of the childcare crisis getting worse year after year, that we wouldn't get to $10 a day right away. Um, but government has listened. They, uh, we're declaring victory for families with young children in this province. This is meaningful change. This is starting to build a system rather than the patchwork of um, disparate services that existed before. Hello, I'm Mary Polak, the Opposition House Leader. Forget about Netflix. If you want good television, tune in to Vaughn Palmer on Voice of BC. So for some of us who spent a long time trying to kill that bloody MSP, this budget is a big disappointment. It seems like it's back in zombie form, taking even more money from British Columbians than it did before. Welcome back to Voice of BC. I don't know about zombie form, but anyway. <laughs> you can always count on Jordan. Yeah, no question yeah, about no, it. That's true. Uh, <laughs> Let's go to the BCTF and Glenn Hansman. We've already talked a little bit about uh, talks starting next year for the next uh, contracts in the public sector. Uh, and here's Glenn Hansman with a question that I think sets the stage for those talks. Here he is. The child care announcement is going to go a long way in terms of addressing recruitment challenges that school districts have around the province. I'm wondering what else BC is prepared to do to address the fact that teacher salaries in this province look nothing like they do in other parts of Canada in order to get qualified, certified teachers to come from Ontario, Alberta to BC school districts. So the education contract actually, I guess, expires at the end of the school year next year, not May 31st, but March 31st, but it's essentially the same date for everyone. And most, uh, all public sector unions are coming off a five-year uh, mandate, as they call it, under the BC Liberals. And I think you're already hearing a lot of them saying that after 
many years of fiscal restraint under the Liberals, they expect a catch-up increase. Is that what you think they're going to be coming at you with? I think that's fair. I think there's no question uh, that there's, there'll be pressure uh, on this issue. But I think it's important to, to note, and I think teachers are, are an example of that, uh, where it's not simply wages that people are looking at, but for people to come to British Columbia now, where you have a government who is following the contract, who has put 3,700 new teachers in place since September in our school system, that's made a huge huge difference to teachers to get the support they need, but most importantly to students to get the support they need. Smaller classes, better working conditions for teachers, better support for students. So it's a win-win from my perspective. The fact that we have made a major investment in education is one of the first things we did in September when we came in. Major investment in teachers. For many, many years across this country, as you know, Vaughn, I, I was quite involved in education through school board. Uh, across this country, BC was looked at a place where teachers didn't need to come because there weren't any teaching jobs. There weren't opportunities there. That was really the message that was out across the country because of the previous government ignoring the contract. Now with smaller classes, with more support for students, that means a need for teachers. Glenn's quite right. We need to make sure we're providing support for teachers to be able to come to BC. And I think we've already made a huge investment by smaller classes, by supporting a contract, and by respecting the people who are help raising the future of our province. A few years ago, I had the heads of the universities on the show, and we were asking them, why are you even bothering to, to graduate teachers? There's no jobs. Are you telling them there aren't any? And now, uh, there's shortages, as exactly. you say. Exactly. Victoria had 500 teachers on the teacher on call list when I was a school board chair. Uh, 500 people who are waiting for full-time jobs. Well, I can tell you most teacher on call lists are empty now. Most of those people are now in the classroom uh, teaching full-time and providing great support to students. Um, in general, um, if everybody across the provincial public sector, and that includes not just central government workers, but everybody in the healthcare system, everyone in the school system, uh, all the social agencies, crown corporations, so there's an awful lot of people out there, I guess what's about 200,000 people That's altogether. Right. If they get 1% across the board, if they all get the same deal, 1% in wages and benefits, it's about $300 million a year on your budget. So That's right. it doesn't take too long for a, a double digit increase to eat up some of that money you've got sitting there. Exactly. People may look at those dollars and think you've got a large amount of money put aside, but if you're talking about reconciliation with First Nations, if you're talking about pressures on on programs, if you're talking about a poverty reduction plan and other programs that haven't been implemented yet, and bargaining, um, that money can disappear very quickly. So we'll go to the table. We're going to be respectful. Um, we know that there are pressures out there, and we look forward to those conversations. Respectful bargaining is really the key here. Another area where the and, and the way it works is that the finance ministry sets what's called a mandate Correct. for bargaining, and then has negotiators that actually handle it. That's right. And and you go back and forth and back and forth and, and the deals don't get all signed at once. No. Not Talks. usually. Usually you have a few who will go ahead, yeah. um, who may even be ahead of the 2019 time period. Um, those discussions happen ongoing uh, with the Public Sector Employers Council. Um, that's who does the bargaining, the master bargaining. Um, and then each of the sectors have their own tables where they talk about issues like safety for workers. That's a big issue, of course, yes. in the healthcare sector right now in particular, but also in the teaching sector and others. Um, those are issues that get brought to the table. So it's not simply about wages. It's also about looking at how we support individuals who provide incredible service in our province and need support. And that process will probably start in a lot of sectors this fall, right? Yes, usually, I expect usually. so. Yeah, yeah, we've started initial conversations, but I think you'll see bargaining yeah. move into 2019. Um, another area where the government's ambitions in terms of expanded programs runs up against some questions about a workforce to provide the services. Uh, here is Stephanie Smith on uh, the child care plan. Hi, Minister James. Um, there's a lot for us to wrap our head around in this budget and certainly a lot for us to be excited about at the BCGU. It's nice to see a budget that is investing in public services and in the public sector. I'm incredibly excited about the child care announcements. As you know, this is something that has, we as a union have worked on for a number of years. I'm curious though, um, on the piece around the recruitment and retention of early childhood educators, what it means in the future when we're talking about compensation and wages for them. It's very difficult to keep people in the sector because of the low wages and I'm looking forward to hearing your government's solutions to that. 
Does the move to licensed also mean a, a move toward unionized uh, public uh, Not childhood educators? Not no? necessarily. Uh, licensed just means that they followed the provincial licensing that's in place there. Um, but I think there, there's a really important point that Stephanie raises, which is uh, we need to make sure that we're recruiting and retaining early childhood educators. We can't build our child care plan without them. We need quality staff. We need more people to go through the program. So we're doing a number of things in this budget as part of the child care plan. We're expanding bursaries for people to go into early childhood mm -hmm. education. We're working with post-secondary to make sure the spaces are available for people to get into the program. We're looking at retraining for existing people in the program so they can get the support to become licensed uh, providers in the in the program. And then lastly, we're also putting in place a work fight place um, development strategy, which will look at everything around recruitment, retention, wages, um, because often what happens, because the wages are very low for early childhood educators, they will move, for example, to the school system and become carrieds in the school system. They can get benefits or they may be able to get a, a more full-time position. They may be able to make better wages. Uh, and so we know that that's an area that we have to look at. So a comprehensive strategy is going to be critical. Um, we're going to need quality staff to provide quality childcare and staff are key. Where are the people, that, where are early childhood educators trained? Are they, are they community college uh, positions? Uh, some private university? colleges, some private colleges, some, some will go for a degree uh, through the universities and some, some through public colleges. Um, and it's a range uh, of, of programs and a range of time for individuals. We're also looking at the quality of those programs because again, that feeds into the quality of child care. So it's another piece that is part of a comprehensive plan to address child care. A uh, question from Torrance Costa, and uh, it's an interesting question. A colleague uh, and I were talking about it the other day, which is that when we keep Ball Radio Global, when we started covering BC politics a century ago, uh, you didn't get very far on the political beat without knowing as much as you possibly could about forestry and the forest industry, and now it just isn't the centerpiece the way it used to be. And a good question here about where forestry was and wasn't in the budget. Here it is. The 2018 budget speech didn't mention forest or forestry a single time. On Vancouver Island, we're losing hectares of ecosystems every day, and we're losing six forestry jobs in British Columbia every single day. Outside of increased funding for wildfire resilience, the Ministry of Forest budget increases only a couple million dollars. How are we going to fix uh, forestry to work for ecosystems and communities with only a couple million dollars of new funding each year? I did notice, though, that the throne speech talked about restoring the social contract between the industry and communities so that if wood is harvested in a region, some of the production jobs are there as well. So clearly there is a strategy coming. There is, and, and I give credit to the forest minister, the natural resources minister, who really has been focused on the wildfires. Doug, um, that really, Doug Donaldson, that really was the big issue as he came in. There was a transition there, as you know, as we became government, and that really has been a big focus. But if you look at both the Ministry of the Environment and the, ministry, and the area that is responsible for forestry, there's a lot of discussion around land use planning. And that addresses the issue that Torrance raised which is making sure that it's a sustainable industry. Making sure there's a connection between the community and the wood, again, will make it a sustainable industry. We've also talked, and again, it'll be coming this year, about how we ensure that we utilize wood more in our buildings. Uh, we're doing a major capital plan uh, in British Columbia. There are opportunities to use wood in those buildings to be able to help the industry, to be able to grow our economy, and to make sure that we're providing quality buildings in our capital plan. So that's another area to stay tuned for. So it's no intent. It's an industry that built our province that I believe will continue to be strong in the future. Softwood, we're watching very closely. That has a huge impact, obviously, on our, on our forest industry in British Columbia, but it's a piece, again, that we're committed to and that you'll see more to come. You mentioned that some of this money that's unallocated in the budget will also be going to uh, new strategies for dealing with First Nations in British Columbia. Here, a suggestion of how uh, some things that might be done is Ken Wu. Over the past century, there have been billions of dollars of timber value extracted from the unceded territories of First Nations. 
Um, I'm wondering if uh, you are at all considering um, directing a portion of stumpage fees or increasing stumpage fees as a means to plow back into First Nations communities to support uh, community economic development and diversification, especially towards uh, sustainable initiatives like ecotourism and cultural tourism, uh, renewable energy, uh, non-timber forest products, uh, sustainable seafood, uh, value-added manufacturing of second growth, rather than the conventional in industries of logging to the end of the old growth and uh, other um, non-sustainable extractive industries. I think Ken raises a really important point, uh, which is, and it really is the direction that we're taking around working with Indigenous people in this province is, how do we share resources? How do we make sure that we're sitting at the table? Right now there are some forest agreements in place with some First Nations, not in others. So how do we have a fair revenue sharing process that works across this province, that works for all First Nations in British Columbia? Uh, and certainly that'll be part of the discussion as well. Um, speaking to a group of uh, property developers uh, recently about the government's housing plan and they said they're you know very encouraged that the government is now determined to do some things to increase the housing supply interesting observation they said it is all very well to want to go out and build a big project in British Columbia it is devilishly difficult mm -hmm. to find skilled workers right now because uh, the economy is doing pretty well and there are a lot of jobs and so there is also a shortage in an area Good question about the shortage of skilled workers. BC Federation of Labour, Irene Lanzinger, here she is. Minister James, I have a question about the funding for the Industry Training Authority. It remains stable uh, and we have a concern about training the next generation of tradespeople. Uh, how do you see providing opportunities for young people to get jobs in the trades under this budget, including women, uh, indigenous people, persons with disabilities, people who traditionally have not had access to good jobs in the trades. We did have a we did push under the previous government, mm -hmm. but there's a running controversy over, for example, whether or not there are sufficient apprentices on some of the big public projects, mm -hmm. and Site C is an example. I gather you're going to be making some changes there. We are project labor agreements, as they're often called, um, where basically you provide on public projects, where it's public dollars, a requirement for apprentices to be utilized on those projects and that you ensure that women and Aboriginal people are part of that mix of apprentices. That's good for everybody because if you train people up they have an opportunity to work on both public and private sector projects and you increase the base of our employees in our province. So that is a commitment. You'll be seeing more news. We're working on that right now and capital projects will be rolling out with the opportunity to do those project labour agreements. We put money into Aboriginal skills training, a large increase in that mm -hmm. budget, which again Again, will help in the area of partnerships uh, for Aboriginal people to be trained up. It's exciting to see those kinds of changes as well. We're increasing spaces uh, in colleges and universities uh, and that's again a future piece that you'll see some announcements. And there are new federal dollars coming around labour market uh, support for people who are unemployed or underemployed and want some training as well. And so those are additional dollars that are mentioned in the budget that will go towards this area as well. So investing in people really is a smart way to invest in our economy. That's what we're focused on in this budget is doing both to make sure that we grow the economy and keep a strong economy going. Bill Tillman with a question that the minister has been asked oh four or five hundred times already uh, but she's a patient person and she doesn't lose her temper. <laughs> There's Bill. Minister, the NDP campaigned in May 2017 on giving renters a $400 tax rebate. It's not in the budget, it wasn't in the throne speech. Will renters ever see it? Yes, the renter's rebate and support for tenants is top of our list. We've started that with this budget by increasing support for the most vulnerable tenants. We're increasing support for SAFER, the seniors, uh, support for seniors who are on low income, the rental assistance program for tenants who are working families um, but who have low income. They'll see an increase in their support. Uh, $900 for seniors, for example, in a year, which will make a huge difference. We've expanded the program so more people will benefit. We're in discussions around the renter's rebate. There've been some interesting ideas about looking at the homeowners grant and making it more equitable and using some of those resources for a renter's rebate uh, because it just helps homeowners and not tenants. So some interesting ideas coming forward uh, and I think there'll be more discussion to come. Uh, it's interesting about the homeowners grant because it gets increased every year mm -hmm. and it has been increased every year for a long time and when you look at the threshold for qualifying for it 
for people who don't already own a home or didn't buy one 40 years ago, it's, it's a staggering amount of money tied up in your property, which is available if you sell it, but maybe you're living on a fixed income in it. Um, and there's been growing calls for the government to either get rid of it altogether or means test it or lower the threshold. So you're actually going to review this we're for the first going, time. Mm -hmm, we're actually going to take a look at it. In fact, the, it was one of the areas that came forward in the interim report uh, from the MSP task force. It was one of the ideas that they had in looking at a fair tax system was perhaps we should be looking at the homeowner grant. So I'm looking forward in their final report to get a little more information um, and be able to move along on some of those conversations. It is a difficult issue because there are seniors who bought their homes when they were yeah. not worth a million dollars and who don't have the income to be able to manage. So we need to make sure we provide that balance. I'm sure it'll be a lively conversation. Whenever you talk about homeowner grant in our province, it's a lively conversation. But I think it's a conversation worth having. Part of my mandate as finance minister is to build a more fair tax system. That's in my mandate letter from the premier. And I think the homeowner grant and the discussion around that has to be part of that. And it's one of the oldest, I guess you'd call it a tax break, in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. It dates back to the 1950s, W.A.C. Bennett. And it... It doesn't actually involve anything other than, an, it's not an accounting trick, but there is no money actually changes right. hands, right? Exactly, just, exactly. And I, everyone, no one would say that the housing market is the same as it was in the 50s yeah. now. So I think it is important to take a look at it. Uh, I think the other irony, of course, is the school taxes on your homeowner grant has nothing to do with school. <laughs> so I remind people of that when I was on school board mm -hmm. often and they yeah. complain about it going up. Money doesn't actually go to education, it's a provincial tax. Well, and what the social services tax is actually the sales Correct. tax, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so, now that government, man, oh man, they give the taxes one name and they spend it for another purpose. So it's, uh, yeah, but, but now on the $10 child care, because mm -hmm. you keep getting asked about that as well. One thing that struck me when I looked at the first raft of changes you've done is that there is an element of means testing in what you're doing. It, mm -hmm. you're, you're saying it will be universal in the long run at the end yeah. of 10 years, but here at the front end, you're putting the resources into the people who need it most. And it's tied to income, for example. That's right. And I think you heard Sharon Gregson say that's exactly the implementation that they wanted to see, was to make sure that the most vulnerable get the most help to begin with, but that you keep the theme of universality uh, and keep that principle for everyone. So in this budget, you'll see families with family income up to 114000 will benefit. They will see a reduction. It'll depend on the age of the child and the cost of the space. Families with $45,000 income and less will see free, uh, in many cases, childcare. So some people will be paying $10, some people will receive free childcare, and people with income up to $114,000 will still see a reduction. So keeping the theme of universality, the principle of universality there, but making sure that the people who are the most vulnerable, who need the support the most, are also able to get it. Is that a, a bit of a shift in philosophy? I mean, the MSP thing is being gotten rid of because it, was, uh, it wasn't really means tested. Uh, people at the high end and the low end got exactly, paid exactly the same premiums. Uh, you're starting off child care with more of a means tested awareness. Is, it, is that a it used to be argued as you know, in public policy areas that the schools were free for everyone, the health care system had access for everyone. Is it now changing that maybe with some of these programs there's a recognition that you start off spending scarce resources to the most needy and don't worry as much about it being universal for everyone? I think it's really the reality of implementation. Uh, so you can't lose the principle of universality. It's a 10-year program, as I mentioned, and as Sharon mentioned as well. So that's certainly the principle uh, for the 10-year program. But the reality of being able to implement a program, one, the system has to absorb the change. I mentioned earlier, we need to train up early childhood educators. We need to build spaces. We could not, even if we had the resources, implement a fully universal childcare system for every parent who needed it or child who needed it today because we don't have the spaces. We don't have the people to be able to provide the support for early childhood education. So yeah, I think it's more a reality of, of implementing, making sure we do it right, making sure it's a BC model 
model, making sure we take the time to be able to implement it, have the resources, make it affordable for families and affordable for the province. So not losing that principle, that's still the aim, uh, but it'll take us some time to get there. Uh, the provincial contribution over three years is a billion. The federal government has put in new money, $153 million over the three years, and it's on top of the provincial. Is it your hope? Do you have any indication over that Ottawa will be coming up with a bigger share of the money going forward? I certainly hope so. I hope we'll see a continuation of, of the agreement. The federal budget comes out in a week and we've heard that there's going to be a focus on gender uh, and a focus on women getting back into the workforce uh, as part of their strategy. Childcare is key to that. You can't address women getting back in the workforce and equity in the workplace unless you address the childcare issue. So that gives me some optimism uh, that perhaps they'll be looking at continuing the funding and continuing the support. That'll give us a chance to do a number of things. Put in place some pilots, for example, for parents who work evenings or shift work or go to school in the evening. That's an almost impossible situation to find childcare. If we're able to try out some of those pilots and see what works, that'll give us a chance to better serve families and better serve children. Children. So there's some exciting initiatives that it'll provide us the opportunity to be able to help Aboriginal directed child care provided by First Nations communities. So some exciting work to come. And a busy year ahead. Thank you very much to the Finance Minister, Carol James, for being on the show. Really Thank appreciate you, it. Thank you for watching Voice of BC, bringing the legislature, BC politics into your living room. Good night.